this is going to finish up Joel chapter 2. And this time we're going to go through and look at why I believe that this is actually the Lord's army, the saints and glorified bodies coming back with Jesus Christ and not the locust army. So Joel chapter 2 and verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So you see that they're blowing a trumpet. They're sounding an alarm. In Numbers, they didn't blow trumpets and sound alarms for locusts. Verse 2, A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not ever been the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So notice it says a great people. Not like or as a great people, but a great people. These are people, saints, who are now in glorified bodies, coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice it says there hath not ever been the like. If it were the locusts of Revelation chapter 9, then there was something like it. You could say there was something like it. They may be much worse, much stronger, much more terrifying than the locust plague in the book of Exodus, but that was still like it. Joel chapter 2 verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. In Revelation 9, those locusts aren't supposed to kill anyone or even hurt the grass or the trees. And yet this says, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. It says, behind them a flame burneth. Now look at what it says about the locusts in Revelation chapter 9, 4 and 5. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the earth, hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So in Joel chapter 2, 3, a fire goes before and after this army. This would kill any person in sight and hurt both the grass and the trees. This isn't the locust army of Revelation chapter 9. Now Joel 2, 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Okay, notice it says, The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, showing he is right down there with them. In Joel 2.25, the locust army is said to be the great army that he sent among them. This army is also separated from the army of verses 1 through 11 with paragraph marks and a, a whole other army in between them. The northern army is placed in between the army of verses 1 through 11 and the army spoken of in verse 25. But that's very significant there. In Joel 2.25, the locust army is said to be the great army that is sent among them. In Joel 2.11, it says, The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, showing he's right down there with them. And then this, there's a northern army placed in the middle of the army of Joel 2.1-11, and the army of Joel 2.25. With that being said, the greatest thing you can do right now is not get mad or argue about on this subject, but, but it's make sure you're saved. Make sure that you're going to be on the winning side of this army when it comes back by believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Because you don't want to be on the receiving end of what this army is going to bring. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. 1 Corinthians 15.1-4 through 4 
explains all that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures. He died on the cross. He, he shed his blood and he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ is the sinless son of God, God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life because you can't. He died on the cross to pay for your sins because you couldn't. You now just have to accept the payment. Come to Jesus Christ with a believing heart, relying on him to be your way to heaven, your payment for sin, your only means of salvation from hell. How much faith do you need? Enough faith to call on him. If you know you're a sinner and you know you're going to hell for those sins, then simply come to Jesus Christ right now. Tell him you know you deserve hell for your sins and that you're going to rely on him and on him alone for salvation. And before the words leave your lips, you'll have already believed in your heart to salvation. All right, now we're going to change things up a bit. And the rest of Joel 2, I want to look at the subject of drawing nigh to God. In James 4, 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Did you know that God wants to fellowship with you more than you do with him? He wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to him. It's the devil who tells you that God doesn't want to talk to you. In Joel chapter 2, we also see that God wants Israel to turn to him again. In verses 12 through 17, you'll see what they will do to cause the Lord to deliver them at the second coming and give them their land. The first thing we see is they're going to have to turn to God with all their heart. In Joel 2.12 it says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. In Acts 26.20, Paul talks about telling the people to turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In 1 Thessalonians 1.9, it talks about how they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So the best thing you can do is turn to God and he'll be right there waiting. He'll be right there waiting for you. He tells them to turn to God with fasting, weeping, and mourning. In 2 Corinthians 11.27, Paul says he is in fastings often. When you give up your meals for the day to seek God and read the words of God, this not only gets even more of the Lord's attention, but it will also help you beat the flesh down. If you can push the plate back and pray, then you'll be able to put a good dent in the sins that you're that are plaguing your life and that's keeping you from God. If you're going to be so much in the Word of God and you're going to be fasting, it's going to be a lot harder for you to do that pet sin that you do consistently every day. You're going to be a lot less likely to commit that sin. And notice, notice also he said weeping. The Bible says Jesus wept. They called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. You should weep now and rejoice later. Because in hell there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. The more you weep here for the soul of someone else, the more you'll rejoice in eternity. If you're saved, then you need to be burdened over the souls of men. You need to mourn. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Ecclesiastes 7, 4, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. The average Christian today is a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. If you forget about the things of this world now, then you'll reap more pleasure in heaven. And a Christian who lives in pleasure still goes to heaven, but they will miss out on rewards. Turn to God. Be broken about not being in fellowship with Him, just like Israel would do in the tribulation before they're restored. So, that's the first thing. Draw nigh to God. You need to draw nigh to God by turning to Him with all your heart. Now, turn to God on the inside to clean up your outside. That's the next thing. In Joel 2.13, it says, And rend your heart and not your garments. 
and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Notice he said, rend your heart and not your garments. You need to get your heart where it needs to be first. Rend your heart, meaning separate yourself on the inside to holiness. Don't worry about fixing up the outside for a show. Don't be like the Pharisees who look good on the outside, but they're actually wicked on the inside. So rend your heart and not your garments. Matthew 23, 27, and 28 shows you the attitude of the Pharisees. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So you see, they wouldn't rend their hearts. They were more about the outside, the clothing, the traditions, the looking holy before men is what they cared about. But the Lord sees the heart. First Samuel sixteen seven, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So Joel 2, 13, And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So turn to God, because he's gracious. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. He gave you salvation. He gives you fellowship even after you did something wicked. He gives you mercy. Mercy is him keeping you from something you do deserve. He keeps you from hell. He's slow to anger. He's not like you. He's long-suffering and patient and of great kindness. So what do you... When do you do these things with others? It's a good chance you're in fellowship with Him. When you show great kindness, when you're long-suffering and patient, when you're slow to anger, when you do these things with other people, if you have that, those characteristics when dealing with people, that shows you're closer to God. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God... For Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So draw not a God, because if you've done something wrong, he's going to forgive you. Joel 2.14, Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leaving a, leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. So if you pray, who knoweth what God might do? He may return and repent, change his mind about the evil he was going to do and even leave a blessing behind him for you. So he repented of what he was going to do to Nineveh when they got right with him in the book of Jonah. And Christians today, if you get right with God and judge yourself, then you may be provoking God to change his mind about the evil that he was going to allow to happen to you. You may even get a blessing. In the tribulation, Israel is going to do this, and maybe the Lord will leave some crops and they'll be able to have a meat offering and a drink offering to offer to the Lord. Now, Joel 2, 15 and 16, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So, first thing we look at is gather the people. You'll be more likely to stay right with God if you're held accountable to others who are right with God. So gather the people. Number two, sanctify the congregation. If you're sanctified, then you're set apart from the world. You want to be a part of a group of Christians who believe in Christian separation. No drinking, no cussing, no fornicating, gossip, dirty jokes, and so on. You want to sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Number three, assemble the elders. Get under a man who can preach to you and teach you the Bible. The preaching of the word will keep you in line. It will keep you in fellowship. Number four, gather the children. You know what will help keep you from getting in trouble? Realize there's somebody counting on you. Gather the children. 
Train up your children in the way they should go. Get up and go to work to provide for them. Read them the book. Learn the stories of the Bible so that you can teach them the stories of the Bible. Gather the children. Joel 2, 15 and 16. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So the bride is the New Testament name for the Lamb's wife. The prophets didn't know about the church, which is, which is the body of Christ, made up of all born-again believers. But we can look back to in it and using the lens of the New Testament, and we can see the church. The bride will come out of her closet at the second coming. It will be no longer a mystery about the church at that time. When Jesus Christ comes back with his saints, that's the bride coming out of her closet. Joel 2, 17, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. If you're saved, then you're a priest. And weeping and mourning is better than laughter. But you're a priest if you're saved. Not a priest like the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, we're not to teach that we can get a hold of God for, for a person because they can't. Or we're not to teach that we can forgive someone's sins. We're not to have a confessional booth and things like that. But the Bible says that the Lord has made us kings and priests in revelation 1 6 you're not a priest with a funny little outfit on but you're a priest who offers up spiritual sacrifices as it talks about in first peter 2 5 what is the last when's the last time you did anything spiritual you may not be a preacher but as a christian you're expected by the lord to get in the book to pray to witness to do something for the lord if anyone sees me reading my bible it's so uncommon to them that they think I must be a pastor of some megachurch somewhere. They think only a preacher reads the Bible uh, because Christians have begun to be so lazy with the things of God that seeing a Christian reading the Bible is a very uncommon thing. Yet, if you go back probably a hundred years, tons of more people were reading their Bible. But when they see someone reading the Bible, they think, well, this guy has to be a preacher. Or this guy has to be some pastor somewhere. But it's not just a pastor that's supposed to read the Bible. It's every Christian should read the Bible and study the Bible. You better get right with God. Trouble, death, pain, sorrow, and crying, trials, tribulations, and horrible things will hit your life. And you need to be already in fellowship with God when they do happen. It'll make it a lot easier to pray when they do happen if you had already been in fellowship. Joel 2.17, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So there are Christians being tortured right now, and the one doing the torturing is thinking, these men have a God, but I'm torturing them. So where is their God? That's what he's saying in his mind. But God is good and everything he does is righteous. And he will let you go through serious pain. And when someone says, I don't know why God is allowing this to happen. I hope deep down that you do realize why. It's because of sin. When you're going through a situation and you're saying, when you say to yourself, why is God allowing this to happen? I hope deep down you realize it's because sin entered into the world and because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And no matter what happens, you deserve worse anyway. Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross and did not deserve it. But trouble's coming, 
pain is coming, you better get right because you'll need to be in close fellowship to help to help you get through it. So draw nigh to God. God will draw nigh to you. When Israel turns back to God and does these things, let me show you what's going to happen. In the tribulation, when Israel does all these things mentioned, turns back to God, it says in Joel 2.18, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. So his land is obviously Israel, and the Jews are his people. The church is also his people. But there is a difference between Israel and the church. But if you want pity, then you do the things we have discussed. And God's going to give you pity, just like he's going to give Israel in the tribulation. And he's going to be jealous for his land and pity his people. A Jew who gets saved today gets put into the body of Christ. But in the tribulation time period, you go back to God dealing with the Jew because the church has been taken out. There is a difference between Israel and the church. Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So if the church is Israel, then this verse doesn't make sense. If you're in the church, you're already saved. It says Israel shall be saved. There's going to be a believing remnant of Jews that the Lord will save. Joel 2, 19, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. So you see, they turned to the Lord. Now he's going to restore them. He's going to restore Israel. Joel 2, 20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hind apart toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. So he's going to remove their enemies. The Lord uses wicked men to persecute his people as a judgment on them, and then he will punish the people. Pun he'll punish the men who punished his people. Their stink shall come up, it says. Joel 2, 21 through 22, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. So the animals and land suffer because of sin, but the Lord is going to restore the land and the trees and the vine so the animals can eat. Joel 2.23, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. This isn't rain as in R-E-I-G-N. This is rain as in R-A-I-N, as in water coming from the clouds above. So there's going to be a great rain after Jesus Christ comes back at the advent that will renovate the land and make it go back to a Garden of Eden-like state for the millennium. And it says in Joel 2, 24, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. So the fats are like vessels that hold the liquid. Joel 2, 25, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. So notice he sent this army among them. This isn't the same ar army of Joel 1 through 11. See, the Lord can restore things. He restores his people as well. He gives them back what the locust has eaten. But remember the locust we discussed in chapter 1? And remember how we talked about the locusts in Revelation chapter 9? The Lord's going to restore everything that, that they destroyed. But notice he calls it my great army. And like I said, many will link this back to the army of verses 1 through 11. However, I proved to you in the previous study that this chapter has three different armies with paragraphs, paragraph marks separating this army from the first army. And then the northern army discussed between this locust army and the army of born-again believers 
coming back with Jesus Christ in verses 1 through 11. So it's kind of hard to make all three of them the same. Also, the army in verses 1 through 11 are called a great people. So Joel 2.26, And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. So this refers to after the Lord comes back. Joel 2.27, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So I believe he's saying this because as you read through the Old Testament, Israel was constantly getting other gods, just like you. You may not bow down to a statue, but a lot of you have been putting your sins ahead of God. You know they're wrong, and you know you're doing it anyway. So this is what you need to do if you're saved. If you're saved, this is what you need to do if you're in sin or have some false God in your life. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. So if you're saved and you're out of fellowship or you've got some sin in your life, come to God right now, confess your sin, and He'll be faithful to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's all you have to do. Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So that's what you need to do if you're saved and you're out of fellowship. But if you're not saved, then what you need to be worried about first is getting saved, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, who will save your soul. If you come to him, the best way you know how to believe the gospel, believe on Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, shedding his blood, he was buried and resurrected. If you'll put your trust in that to pay for your sin, Believing that from the heart, then you're saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.